Okay, well, it's six o'clock, so it's time to get started. We'd like to welcome everybody to our uh, uh, Phoenix Full Gospel Businessmen Chapter Zoom meeting. <clears throat> now, we've had these Zoom meetings because of the COVID uh, virus uh, has prevented us from getting together, and uh, it's really been a hit, and a lot of people, they, uh, they found out if they're not online uh, live, then they can watch the YouTube video. So we have a lot of people watching our YouTube videos after the fact at their convenience. So we're finding a new technology here, and I think God can use all technologies. And uh, anyhow, we're really excited to have Brian Godawa here. And uh, he is uh, a real good friends with one of our chapter members, Don Ann and Voltson. So we're going to let them chat. You know, went to the same Bible uh, uh, home fellowship together. And uh, anyhow, uh, you know, I you know, welcome everybody that's here in this, gonna watch this later on. Now, let me mention a, a little commercial. Next week, we have the Vicar of Baghdad. Now, next week, we're gonna host the United States and the Vicar lives in England somewhere. And uh, so he's gonna be, it's gonna be one o'clock in the morning, his time, but he's an amazing man. He, he was the guy they went to to uh, help negotiate peace between the Muslims and the Jews. And uh, he, he ran the church of, uh, there in Baghdad for many, many, many years and was there when Saddam Hussein <clears throat> was taken down and was the only church there <clears throat> where a lot of the allied forces and the Christians could come and they had up to 6,500 people went to his church. So he also, his grandfather was a, a, an assistant to Smith Wigglesworth. And that name might sound familiar to some, some of you people. So anyhow, that's next week. So uh, that'll be our Christmas. This is a Christmas presentation too, Brian. And uh, we're glad to have you. And so we'd like to turn it over to Don. Why don't you start talking, Don? All right, this is this is pretty exciting. I uh, I first heard of Brian when a movie came out, and I think it was two thousand four, uh, called "To End All Wars." Uh, Kiefer Sutherland and Robert Carlyle, and uh, we had uh, actually hosted a Biola University media conference in Phoenix, and I got to chair one of the four years we did that. And one of those years, we got the producer Jack Hafer to come out and just happened to coincide with the opening night of the movie. So we were able to do a screening in the theater with him there to do Q and A. And so I knew Brian had written it, went to another conference about a year later, I guess, or maybe the next spring. And Brian was one of the speakers. I got to shake hands with him. I doubt he even remembers that. But uh, after we had moved to Los um, we went to this home fellowship thing. It was a Christian, Christians and arts and media uh, meeting. It was a home Bible study kind of a setting. And I think it was like a second week I was there. There's Brian Gadawa. And so we just got talking and we had a lot of mutual interests, especially in prophetic and revelation. And he assumed that I was going to be one of those people that he can chew up and, and spit out for lunch. You know? <laughs> but uh, we got, he read some of my stuff and called me back later and said, this is pretty good. And we, we got together and talked and, had dinner with our wives. They were having a nice conversation, getting to know each other. And we got into a debate on something like predestination or something. And we were just really yelling at each other. I think <laughs> our wives believe they would never meet each other again. This was their last time. But in fact, Brian and I were having a great time and we became best of friends. And yeah. um, some of those debates are some of the most memorable moments, but um, Amen. spent a lot of time with him and his wife. And, and uh, I know Brian to be one of the the best Bible scholars I've ever been around, and particularly in prophetic areas. And then he recent, more recently did a lot of study in a lot of ancient biblical period history, especially things to do with the divine council and the Nephilim. And, and uh, more recently, he talked about Jezebel. And I, so I really digs into it at a level that very few people ever touch. So it's kind of exciting to have him here. And I don't even know what you want to talk about. You've been, is this Jezebel thing the most recent project? 
Yeah, t- yeah, in one way it is. Um, my most recent book release is called When Watchers Rule the Nations, and it's actually the uh, part two to the book uh, When Giants Were Upon the Earth, and that's my best-selling book. And that's where I deal with the theology of the Divine Council and the Nephilim and the Watchers and all that stuff. And, and it's basically the theological foundation for my novels. And while I'm happy to talk about anything and everything, um, my, for me personally, the novels are my... my uh, whatever, my, my heart's cry, because uh, I, I just have a personal passion for the God's imagination. And so I love to be able to learn truth as well as communicate truth through story, narrative, arts, imagination, etc. Because I think that that's a, an aspect um, of, of knowing God and understanding God that is greatly unappreciated you know and so particularly i come from a reformed tradition that's my my tradition and particularly there uh, although it didn't start that way necessarily but um or no shall we say it's it started negatively and we've had the ramifications all through the years but in later years the dutch came in and they helped us out and uh to get a little bit more appreciative of the arts uh so yeah so um the latest novel is jezebel and what, what I've done is I've tried to retell Bible stories. I'm, what, I did, what I'm doing is I've got like a series of eight novels and a series of four and then another growing series that's just started with two and Jezebel's the first one. And what these novels do is I like to, I like to do what the ancient Jews did. You know, if, if you've heard of some of these old books like, uh, you know, like they call them the pseudepigrapha, right? Whether it's Enoch or the book of Aristides or the, you know, the, the song, so, uh, not the song, the, um, the, the keys of Solomon, whatever, all these, these jubilees. And, and unless, Tim thinks, unless Tim thinks we're going to get too deep there, the, the pseudepigrapha, for those who don't know, are basically a lot of those writings that took place between the Old and New Testament. Um, yeah. One you might be familiar with probably is like Enoch, Book of Enoch, for example, because yeah. that's quoted in Jude. But that's the kind of stuff he's talking about. There's some really interesting writing if you ever feel like getting into them. But, yeah, and the Apocrypha yeah. could be considered uh, in that sort of school as well. The idea is that what they would do is, so these books weren't considered scripture, but what they would do is they would retell their their ancient biblical stories in their own time period sort of retelling them and and you know they would add some imaginative flair or just try to sort of make it relevant to their situation and so that's what i'm doing i'm i'm trying to retell bible stories but sort of make them relevant to today but also uh the biggest thing that that inspired me was <clears throat> when i discovered the as don you mentioned this already you know the, the divine counsel motif in scripture when I discovered that reading Michael Heiser's work, you know, about 11, 12 years ago, it blew my mind because it opened the Bible up to stuff that was always there. So this isn't some kind of secret knowledge. It's just because it's rooted in the ancient Jewish mindset. We're not, we don't see it because we're reading English translations. and We've got our own modern day mindset, the way we interpret much of the Bible. And when it, when I saw that divine counsel motif, which we can talk about, but it, it's sort of like, I, I saw the Bible fresh. I, now, of course, I didn't see anything different, anything contradictory. <laughs> it wasn't something new or different. It was more expansive of God and his glory and, and his angels and how all that you know operates in our world. It's a very supernatural view. And like I said, I don't come from as much of a supernatural view background. So it was very refreshing for me and opening up for me. And it was so much so that I had to tell, I had to retell these Bible stories because I now saw a lot of things that are there that I didn't, and it all makes sense. It's not just these like, what are those weird anomalies in the Bible? Like when, you know, when it says before the flood, you know, the the Nephilim were there. What what what's that about, right? You know, and 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 all these strange passages now make a lot more sense in this context, and that's the context of the divine council, which is what I'm. Um, you know, carrying through in a lot of the novels, which we can talk about if you'd like. Well, let's talk about that. And I, those, yeah, and let me just plug your books too, because a series of novels, you don't have to be a deep scholar to enjoy them. They're just fun to read. But then Brian tacks an appendix onto the end of them that you know, like a third of the book is this really in-depth scholarly explanation of what goes with the novels. 
And it's a really fun way to learn a lot of this background material to the Bible. And so I highly recommend them. I, I guess I know of Primeval was the first one you wrote. What's the first one actually in the series, though? You went earlier, didn't you? Well, uh, yeah, Enoch is technically the prequel. But, uh, you know, you start you can start with Noah and then read Enoch. I'm glad you brought that up because that's true. I'm, I love theology and I love talking about that. And I also lapse into it. But the truth is, I'm also a Hollywood screenwriter, you guys. And in fact, I'm equal parts both. So my actual primary goal when I write these is to write an entertaining story. So I've got it all. I've got romance, wars, epic. Uh, it's an, you know, it, they're epics, right? And my number one goal is to entertain. And that's one of the differences where I feel like, um, Christians need to appreciate that God wants both theology, truth, and imagination to be equally valuable. You don't put down what, oh, well, the, the arts and that, that's okay, it's good, but it's not as necessary as this theology or what have you. No, God values them both. And so I value them both equally when I write my stories. And I'm kind of proud of the fact that people really can enjoy them, like you said, Don, in a way where you don't have to, it doesn't have to be this big yeah, theological they're, thing. They're just, they're just fun to read. I yeah. mean, I, I sat down, I read one, uh, the Noah one, before it was published. I, I got to kind of go over it. You were my it first editor. Bit. I was the first editor on the whole thing, and I don't know how good I was, but I started reading and I could not put it down. It, imagine Noah as like a, a comic book superhero character, but telling his story in that pattern, but true to the biblical uh, facts. I, I mean, it's, I know it's hard to wrap your head around. You just have yeah. to read one to appreciate you know, it. But that's a good, fun. That, that's a good example because, um, uh, you know, I do up, up end a lot of preconceived notions that we have, like for instance, what do we think of when we think of Noah and the Ark, right? You know, you basically think of the Sunday school paintings on the walls with all the little animals going in and all, you know I mean? Or Noah is this old guy with a white beard like Don, you know, he looks like Don. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> your beard, probably. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like you've got this, this, this picture, but these, the, the, that's not in the Bible. The Bible doesn't say very much at all about those details, right? It just sort of describes them and describes the events. And so, I, I, I was thinking, okay, I'm trying to be consistent with the Bible. I'm thinking, that what, is the, what does the text say? The text says that, you know, that the, the wickedness of man's heart was only evil constantly, right? You know, he's like, so he lives in this constant evil world. Who could survive in that unless you were maybe a warrior of some kind or a tribal leader who could fight? And so I, I made Noah into a tribal warrior leader and it, it, you know, it's imagination, but it, it still, I try to make it fit with the concepts of what's going on in the text, if that makes sense. So I'll, I'll fill in the things we don't know with creativity, but I try to connect all the things that we do know. Yeah, they're really brilliant. And, I, and the things you delve into, let's get back to the divine council, because I think everybody's sure. interested in that. Let, I mean, let's just define it a little bit first, because a lot of people probably don't even know what that means necessarily. Yeah, very good. Um, so there's a couple, there's just a couple verses that I'd want to, um, you know, sort of just address quickly to def help define it. Um, oops, sorry, Deuteronomy 32. So first of all, uh, if you want to get the big picture, you look at Psalm 82. That will be a good description of kind of what's going on. But if you want to understand the kind of concept, like what does it mean? What's it all about? It begins in Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 through 9. And that's where it says, When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. And so basically what that passage is talking about is this idea that um, it's talking about Babel because that in, in the Bible, that's where he divides mankind. He fixes the borders. All that's in Babel in, what is it, Genesis 11. And so well, that's I break when, in right there. For a second sure. too, most people, when, when they're reading this, um, your translation probably doesn't say that. It probably says according to the sons of Israel. But yeah. the Dead Sea Scrolls and some later translations have shown us that the original was the sons of God. Uh, the Hebrew word is B'nai Elohim. So just yep. in case you look it up and it reads different, that's why. Yep. 
and that's important sorry, because sorry, no that's that. that's important because that phrase sons of god is what goes all the way back to genesis 6 which is which was for me the the strangest you know passage in the bible and which what which is what launched the whole novel of noah because that's where it says that um in fact let me go there because I'm, I'm not very good with memorizing so so it says when man began to multiply in the face of the land and daughters were born to them the sons of god saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose and and then it talks about the nephilim being on the earth in those days and then it talks about the wickedness of man being great on the earth and so you know who are these nephilim the nephilim were in the earth those days and also afterward when the sons of god came into the daughters of man and if you do a, a proper biblical study on that phrase sons of god it's literally a, a theological technical term that always refers to angelic heavenly host and so what it's saying there is that these some of these angelic beings violated uh their their heavenly uh, uh the heavenly earthly divide as i call it right they they violated that separation of heaven and earth and they came down to earth to mate with uh human women and that was uh, of course created the nephilim and those were the giants and and you know i always I, it's so weird i used to think like what what <laughs> you know and that sounds like mythology that sounds like greek mythology right and I, of course, I think that uh, Greek mythology and a lot of uh, ancient religious mythology all talk about giants of some kind. And I think that it's, they're all pointing back to what really did happen, but they all have distorted pictures of it, in other words. But the, the idea there is that, so what are these giants? What's the point? Is that just that there's weird anomalies? No, actually, there's a real purpose behind the Nephilim and behind those giants, because those giants become the, the, the um, abominable creatures that end up um, inhabiting Canaan when, when uh, Joshua gets there, and Joshua is commanded by God to wipe them out. So when he goes to wipe out those tribes, they're tribes of giants. And so, and, and so, in other words, they're linking those inhabitants of the land to the original evil beings before the flood, which is part of the justification for why they're getting rid of them. Um, but that, that's, the, that's the giant side. And then there, there, are, there are stories in the Bible where giants show up. We all know Goliath, right? That's the classic one, over nine feet tall, nine, nine and a half feet tall. But there are other giants that were hunting David. And this is something that, you know, and it's, again, it's not hidden. It's just we read over this stuff and we don't, we don't catch it. And there was like five of them that were actually hunting him and they had to be killed by David's mighty men. What's going on here? All these giant things, right? So I, I, that's what I, I tried to make sense of all that through the novels and, of course, in an entertaining way. But the other side, so that's one side of the coin is the giants. And we can talk more about that and how it relates. But the other side was those sons of God. And the, the sons of God are these, these heavenly beings that, that fell from heaven. And so when you get to Psalm 82, you read, uh, well, first of all, you know, we saw that in Deuteronomy 32, it talks about how, um, let's put it this way, in its simplest form possible, we know that, you know, Yahweh was Israel's God. And, and he chose, they were, they were his allotment, and he was their allotment. That's that phrase, a theological phrase, allotment. And then he allots the nations, the Gentiles, to these fallen sons of God. And so what's, what's the point of that? Well, I think part of the worldview that comes out throughout the Old Testament is that the Jews understood the Gentiles. This is why they were apart from God, was because they were ruled over by these demonic fallen angelic beings also called watchers daniel talks about the watchers of you know the the prince of uh persia and, and such right so there are there are these spiritual beings who uh, are over the nations and that's a that's a common understanding in the bible as well as other ancient uh, uh religions was that uh there was a link between the earthly authorities and nations and heavenly principalities so that whatever there was a war on earth there was a war in heaven so to speak right and so if when when uh when a, a nation or a king falls and it's usually connected to the the rulers you know and and so they link these kings to these heavenly beings and so that's how the bible understands it so that's why the gentiles are under or they're allotted to those those what we would now call pagan deities so to speak right 
And so they are allotted to them, but Israel is allotted to Yahweh. And so that's why when, when, when it comes to the gospel, when Messiah comes, and this is what Psalm, is, Psalm 82 is talking about, Messiah is going to take back those, those, uh, uh, those Gentile nations from those fallen sons of God. And that's what the gospel is, that now people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation can come into the kingdom of God because they've been freed from this, this um, uh, slavery, so to speak, right? Spiritual slavery to these, these other demonic entities. And that's the basic, uh, you know, the basic paradigm. But Psalm 82 sort of spells the whole thing out. In fact, I even wrote a whole booklet on Psalm, called Psalm 82, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> which you can get on Amazon for just five ninety nine. But um, anyway, I, I go through that that uh, Psalm verse by verse, and ex, and go you know through an extended exegesis throughout scriptures about it. And just to, real quickly, I'll just read most of it. It says, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And that, of course, as an evangelical Christian, that always bothered me because I'm like, wait a minute, th wouldn't that be polytheism? There are no other gods. There are no, what, what, what's going on, you know? But as, as I'm sure Don has, has communicated as well, that the, the phrase for gods in Hebrew is Elohim, and their understanding of that is not the same as the way we in modern day world think. When we hear the word God, we think of something very differently than they did. In the ancient mind, the, the, there were many gods, but one true and, and creator God of them all. And these gods, or Elohim, were basically any beings that were existing in the spiritual realm. So sometimes angels are called gods in scriptures. Sometimes a, uh, the spirit of a dead human, like Samuel, was called an Elohim, right? And God is called an Elohim because they all exist in that spiritual plane. But of course, Yahweh is the Elohim of Elohims. He's the God of all gods. So like these gods are not the same kind of thing that, God, that Yahweh is. God is the only one who's all powerful, you know, sovereign and um, all knowing. And, and, you know, I'm saying he's the only creator God. And, and so this word Elohim and gods in the Bible doesn't mean um, the kind of creatures that we or that we normally think of i guess is what i'm saying you know but yet in a way they're similar so here it is it's saying that so god holds a council and these elohim are around it and he's holding judgment and what is he judging and then you hear the phrase god speaks how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked give justice to the weak and fatherless maintain the right of the afflicted rescue the weedy and the the needy and deliver the hand them from the hand of the wicked so they've been charged these these gods right these spiritual beings which i'm i'm going to uh explain that they are these sons of god that were allotted to the nations so in other words god allotted the nations to them and they were given the authority to rule over them and did these beings rule justly? Of course not. They were demonic. They led them astray. And then it says in verse 5, they have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. And this is where he says, I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die. All fall like any prince. So what he's saying there is that these gods were given this authority they're the sons of the Most High. And sons of the Most High is another way of saying sons of God. It's very similar terminology. It's the same thing. But he's saying, I'm going to judge you. You're going to die like men, even though you're divine beings from heaven. You're going to die like men because you did not rule properly. And then the last verse says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, and you shall inherit all the nations. And that's a verse that I would argue is a reference to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Arise in Greek is the same, aneste is the same word that Paul also tends to interpret. When he picks out the word arise in the Old Testament, he, he applies it to the resurrection. It's Jesus who rises and judges the earth, and it's Jesus who inherits all the nations, right? That's Psalm uh, 2, right? So, so this is Jesus who arises, is through his resurrection, he destroys, uh, let's put it this way, through his resurrection, he takes back the allotment of the nations from those sons of God because they were wicked and he judges them 
right? And as Messiah, he takes back those lots, those allotment. He judges those beings, and they, they die. So like any other human, that's their judgment. And, and then that's where I'm saying that's the, another expression of the messianic hope of the gospel, that he, then because Jesus now owns the inheritance of the nations, that's why men and women from every tribe and every tongue and nation are no longer under bondage to those divinities, and that's why they can come into the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's how I understand it. There's now within my this world of of all divine counsel and stuff. There are different you know different variations of the way they interpret it, and I'm sure Don can explain to you his as well. But but that's kind of how I see it, and that's the picture that I wanted to tell in my stories. And so what I do throughout my novels is I try to picture that spiritual world. I try so like for instance when I'm telling the story of Jezebel, Jezebel was a pagan. Uh, princess from Tyre who married King Ahab of Israel. She lured him into worshiping Baal. And Baal comes from her religion and it also has Canaanite origins. And so what I did was I showed, I tell the story of Jezebel and Ahab and Elijah and all that stuff, but I also show what would it be like, what if these gods of the nations, like the gods of Canaan, we could talk about those gods, Asherah, Baal, Ashtart, Molech. What if these gods that people worshipped, what if there was a demonic reality behind them? In other words, what if they were these sons of God who were masquerading as, as deities in order to lure people away from Yahweh? And so I have these gods actually show up in the stories. I've got Asherah, like I said, Baal, Mot, all these various Canaanite deities. But what they are is they are these fallen sons of God who were over the nations like Canaan, and they were ruling in the spiritual realm. So when God, through his people, um, comes in and takes power of the land, then those gods are disinherited to some degree. Of course, they never do it completely, right? But but um, so that's the battle that I describe in the novel Jezebel, as well as all of Chronicles. The, the, the um, series is called Chronicles of the Nephilim. And um, or, I'm sorry, that's the main series. And then there's another series, Chronicles of the Watchers, and that's what Jezebel is a part of. But they're all sort of the same thing, just tell, retelling these Bible stories. And so that's, that's what I try to do. Is that, and, and so when you read it, you'll actually learn what are the beliefs of ancient Canaanites that the Israelites were interacting with. And you'll also find and come to an understanding of why did, why did it keep saying in the Bible that the Israelites kept falling away and worshiping these gods and goddesses? It was just so weird, right? Why would they do that, you know? And I try to make sense of that by bringing in that spiritual realm and showing, well, here's... Here's what it might have looked like in the spiritual realm, which of course is obviously speculation and, and imagination, but again, trying to be true to that biblical flavor of of the supernatural that that I've just been talking about. Does that does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That that's a pretty good explanation. I, I think, and and my own view of it from having studied a lot of the same stuff that you've all gone through is not very different from yours. <laughs> a few little details we might argue over, but. Um, the, the it, what it seems to me though, and I think I think you agree with this that the the Bene Elohim, the sons of God, would be like a higher class of angels, like there's a hierarchy, and they would be in a pagan religion. You would have a divine council, like with Baal. When you read the Baal epic and some of those other Middle Eastern ancient texts, you've got the head god, and then there's a a next layer is a bunch of like sub gods who are all you know administer everything and then there's the lesser angels or gods underneath them and it so that particular group seems to be among the more powerful and that maybe that'll help people to kind of picture it in this stratified thing yeah and that same kind of pagan setup appears in the bible it's just that they're they're called gods but they're not the same as the way the gods are there it's like the gods in the pagan religion are um masquerading and I always yeah. think I've always thought it interesting that every one of these ancient pagan religions have a a creator God who the next God down throws out and takes over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and look, I, again, I'm like, 
Oh, go if, ahead. If I were Satan, that's how I would tell the story. You know, yeah, mimic the create mimic the real world. The eagles, like, the mountain took over. I mean, that's that's how I would try and spin it. And you almost get the impression that's what happened, and that these angels now have kind of created their own religion, so to speak, to try and rule over mankind. And exactly. I think that's basically what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah, very and, similar and anyway. Exactly. And I, I'm very keenly aware of the, this is, this can be very shocking. And I, honestly, I don't know how familiar y'all are with it, but it was shocking to me and it's shocking with other Christians hear it. And so I'm very sensitive to the fact that using the term gods is, you know, to a normal Christian mind, it's sort of like, wait a minute, you know, and, and, but I do believe that we have to, we have to learn sometimes things in the bible are, do not match the way we have created even in our own christian culture and we need to be as close to the bible the way the bible speaks and so if if it makes people feel better go ahead and call them angels but you have to understand the word angel actually just means messenger and sometimes a human's an angel sometimes these divine beings are angels another thing i tell people is you know if you're afraid to use that word gods because it just feels polytheistic i totally get that i really do but i feel like the more you get into the mindset of the ancient jew I, you talk you use their language and it's really not even a big deal but but i also say well look if you're if you don't like to use the word god use divine beings you know because divine beings maybe you don't want to use the word deity because that sounds too much like god but a divine being which an angel is a divine being too right and, and that's fine if, if it makes people feel more comfortable um, because I, I realize, you know, coming to understand this is, is, it takes steps. And, and I just still remember the shock that I had. And sometimes when I'm talking to people, I'm thinking, they must be, they might be thinking like, is he a Mormon or something? You know? And I'm like, no, no, this is not that. Well, it, you know? helps, it helps to understand that the, the word angel comes from the New Testament Greek word angelos. And it's really just a transliteration of it. But that word in the New Testament covers a lot of spiritual beings that in the Old Testament, there are more specific, precise terms for. Because yes. in the Old Testament, you have seraphim and, and cherubim and um, a, a number of different things. And so we, we could almost think of the sons of God as archangels, maybe. Yeah. Like um, yeah, Michael would fair. be the archangel or the, the son of God that's over Israel. And he would be very similar to all these others. I mean, if that helps you wrap your head around it, maybe that's a way to look at it. But yeah, yeah it is a little shocking or we've just grown up not thinking in these terms. And it's, but you're right. When you, the more you read the old Testament and get into that Jewish mindset, the more sense this makes. And uh, yeah. that's what makes this so interesting to me. Yeah. And I know I was starting to delve into it a little bit, probably about the same time you were, and you went a lot further with it a lot faster than I did. <laughs> it's, yeah, but it's, I, def it's fast. I definitely like just, yeah. I just, I feel like I fell into this world, this big sea, and, and it's just like in a good way, not like a drowning sea, but just like this ocean of fascination and imagination, you know, and the, like I said, the Bible opened up, you know, I mean, there, there are so many cases where, where, um, uh, things make more sense with this context, you know, and uh, anyway, but can keep, an keep example, talking. Do you think of one off the top of your head? Yeah. Uh, some, well, one example of maybe one that, you go, wow, well, that's what that means, you know, that would be relevant now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should be more prepared for this because there are plenty of examples of this. Okay, well, all right. There is, um, give me one second, I, I should be more prepared, but I know the document that has, I don't memorize these verses, so, but I know where I save them, and I save this, oh, of course, now I'm having problems. Getting... And maybe we could address, too, where you think Satan himself fits into this, or how you view him as, I mean, is he one of these beings, is he something lower than that, something different, or, or demons themselves, uh, do you have any views on any of those things? So maybe sure. Those are several no, that... questions. That's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, you know, okay. So let's see here. Prince. Okay. You know, I'll, I'll, I think one, I mentioned this passage already, but, but it's a good one to use because it's what most people are going to be at least familiar with. And, and this is a good transition, you know, and that is Dan, the book of Daniel. So, you know, this is where the term watchers occurs in Daniel and Daniel's having these visions and Daniel four, he says, you know, I'm laying my bed with visions and a watcher, a holy one came down from heaven. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision, decision by the word of the holy ones. 
Now, again, in my books, I go, th I explain why, why the phrase holy ones and watchers are synonyms for the sons of God and these angelic beings who are rulers over the nations. So there's a lot of words and phrases that they use interchangeably. And this is one of those, but it, in the text, it sort of defines it for us. It says that, you know, um, so this is where the term watchers comes in. And people may have heard that phrase because that phrase is only used here in Daniel, but it's used a lot in the book of first Enoch. And the book of first Enoch is, is one of those books where it's not scripture. However, it has a long pedigree of respect in the history of the Christian church from the beginning. And in the modern day, we've just lost respect for all any books that aren't the Bible. And unlike the, the ancient church that did have respect for it, even though it didn't consider it scripture. And so there's a lot of interesting expansions in Enoch. But in Daniel in the 10... Church, the, church fathers, the church fathers spoke when they were developing the, the biblical canon, you know, which books are belong in the Bible and which ones don't. They referred to a lot of these books as not divinely inspired like scripture and not considered scripture, but very useful. And that's, that Excellent. makes it a, it's a good way to really think about a lot of this stuff. It's like, we have a lot of books today that are not scripture that are written by modern authors. They're very useful. Well, that's the same as true of a lot of these other ancient books too. So. Excellent point. Excellent point. So these watchers are these, these, the, these divine beings, these holy ones, right? And then in Daniel 10, he, they, they use this, this other term called princes and all pretty much all commentaries will tell you that these the, when, in Daniel 10, when it's talking about the prince of the kingdom of Persia and, the, and, and Michael, the prince of Israel, that these are references to supernatural principalities. That's what the word prince means, right? And they're not earthly, earthly beings, but it says that the prince of kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, Michael the archangel, right, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. And then he also talks about, uh, I guess I lost the other one. He talks about the Prince of Greece, right? And so this was that thing I was telling you that, that um, uh, there are, you know, the ancient world believed that there were princes over these nations. So that when Persia was, uh, was so, so uh, Daniel's under the, you know, uh, Prince of Greece, spiritual principality of Greece, right? The Jews are in Babylon, so they're in exile, and the spiritual principality of Greece is the Macedonia and, and such is going to come and battle with Persia. And of course, we know that Babylon exchanges hands with Persia and Greece and such. So, so it's describing these earthly, national, uh, political events. They describe it in terms of these princes over the nations, right? And so that's what- Would it, would it be accurate? Would it be accurate to say, I mean, think of this like the idea of a guardian angel, which we do have a concept of that today, but like a guardian angel attached to a nation. I mean, almost the same kind of thing. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. I've heard the term territorial spirits. I, I don't know the full theology of how people are thinking of that. So I don't tend to use that term, but that might be something similar um, in the sense that there are spirits over these territories or over these nations, right? At least that's how the ancient mind understood it. So that, that's one example where I used to read that and just go, I don't know, it's a vision, whatever, you know, uh, but now it makes more sense because it's like, oh, okay. Um, this is what's going on. These are these, these watchers, right? And they're battling while there's battles on, on earth. Uh, another one more example might be kind of, well, should I, should I use my Leviathan example? That's one of my favorites. Sure. So, um, well, I'll stick with the gods. Leviathan's more like the sea dragon of chaos. Let's stick with, um, oh, here we go. Demon so, this is something that I, I've, I, that fascinates me, and I think it, it starts to make some sense. So in Deuteronomy 32, it talks about how, you know, he's talking about how Israel was unfaithful to God. And in verse 17, it says, Israel fell away from God, and it says, they sacrificed to demons that were not God, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently. So there's that connection of, in other words, there's not just something we're making up and we're saying, oh, these are demonic. It, the text actually links those Canaanite gods that 
Israel was sacrificing to, they, it links them to some kind of demonic reality. Now, I'm not saying that there is actually a, uh, a demon named Baal or something like that. I don't know how that all works, but maybe, maybe there's something like that going on. But there's certainly demonic reality behind those gods. They're not just, you know, uh, stones that they create. And so um, there, are, there are several verses that show up. Um, okay. Might also so it helped to mention that in the ancient world, we have texts that are, they call them the washing of the mouth, which is our animation rituals where they, the ancients actually never believed that the stone idol that they carved of something was actually anything divine. They would carve it. And then they went through this whole ritual, which was designed to actually call the spirit of the God into the idol. And in fact, if they burned the idol, they considered it to be disembodying this, the God. I mean, so they, they had an understanding that the idol was just a piece of wood or stone, but until a spirit came into it and then they worshiped it. That, that was an ancient concept in all the pagan world. Excellent, so that might excellent point. Because yeah. we in modern day, we think like, oh, they're worshiping, what idiots, how primitive can they be that they bow down and worship to idols of wood and stone? That's obviously not God's. Well, yeah, there's a side of that that you can argue because Isaiah mocks them for the same reason. But there's another side to that, what you're saying, which is that it's not that they think those things are the gods, but they think that the, the spirit of the God has come into it in order to connect with them. And that's what an image does, which is interesting because we are supposed to be imagers of God. We are, the same word they use for idols, image, is what they use of man. Right. And we are supposed to be those created clay, right? That has the spirit of God in us. So it's a very similar, you know, in, in many ways, at least it helps you to understand that a little bit. Um, now I'll, I'll use- We, we are the statue of God. What's that? We, we, are the actual, we are the actual statues of God that the world yes. sees. Yes, I think that's the idea. And by the way- That's what being is, the image of God really is. And I also think this, this it sort of brings new meaning to the phrase sons of God in the New Testament, right? Because what is the New Testament talks about? We are the sons of God, right? And you know, of course, we've always understood that as a familial term, which it is. And in fact, that's what I think the whole point of B'nai Ha Elohim, sons of God is, is that they were kind of a family of God, right? And so the Bible says that through Christ, we become sons of God. And so we are becoming like what those beings once were. And so uh, when we get glorified, we will be, we will have the same heavenly essence as those original sons of God had. Now, now while we're corrupted on this earth, we don't, but we have the start of it because we have the, the Spirit, Holy Spirit of God in us, right? And so this, this, now when you read the word sons of God and you will be sons of God, now you'll have a different understanding when you'll say, wow, we are going to become like they were um, the ones that fell, but we're going to be replacing them. We're going to be God's family. Uh, we already are God's family, but you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, the resurrection and such. So, um, some of these terms and even Jesus being the own, the unique son of God. Well, he was, he was the son of God, like none of the sons of God were, but he was a son of God like they were. So what that means is, is Jesus uh, you know, that, that phrase, the only begotten son of God, the actual, the, the Greek, that's not very good translation. The Greek is more saying he's the unique son of God, meaning he is one of many, but he's unique in that he's the only son of God who is God in the flesh. So in other words, these other divine angelic beings are not God, but Jesus is one of them. It's just that he's unique in that he's the only one that is God himself, if that makes sense. So that kind of expands that understanding of um, the Son of God as well. My, my next, my next question, is, you know, would you may have already started to answer would have been like, okay, this is all very interesting, but so what? You know, where I live today, does any of this matter? But what you just brought up may be the key to that. That, and in fact, maybe that's why the demons and Satan are so angry, is because they are being replaced as God's representatives to administer this earth. So in other words, the Christian life is not about just getting saved so I can go to heaven and 
bask on a cloud and fellowship with God forever. Getting saved is about taking on the responsibility of being the visible image of God to the world and representing him as his family, as his sons of God. Is, is that kind of what you're getting Amen. at? Amen. Amen. Is that that's the so it. what? And, and I, that's the so what. And I have to say that, you know, Michael Heiser is really good on this. You know, I, I don't go as much into that this, the New Testament side, I've because I'm staying in the Old Testament mostly. But, uh, but you know, Heiser's book, um, The Unseen Realm, really does lay that out in more detail in, in a better way than I could. But, but uh, yeah, that's exactly it. So you're right. I that, just read it. Months ago. I just read it a couple of months ago, and it's it's worth reading. Anybody who's really interested in this topic, yeah. it, it's probably the best compendium of this information I've seen. Yeah, yeah. So, so. The Unseen Realm by Michael Heiser, H-E-I-S-E-R. Thank you. So. <laughs> but of course, yeah. buy my books first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your books are a lot more fun. <laughs> I, well, I'll tell you what, I do a lot of similar stuff to what he does in my books. Um, when Giants Were Upon the Earth, that's my, that's the, so you mentioned that at the end of each novel, I write appendixes, appendices. And the reason why I did that actually was, as a Christian, I know Christians like to have things explained. And especially if you're stretching the envelope like I was doing, because look, in my novels, I show the spiritual supernatural world, like sort of like pulling the veil back. And of course that's gonna require speculation, right? And um, I, use, I use the fantasy genre as a, as a means for showing that spiritual world. So some people might read that, Christians might even read that and get a little freaked out and go like, is he playing with the word of God? And so what I wanted to do was I wanna say, no, calm down, don't worry here's here's where i'm getting that from the bible and yeah obviously i'm speculative and filling in between the lines but uh i put those appendices because i i, I respect the fact that christians do want to have biblical proof for everything and that's how i was raised so that's what inspired me to do it but then what i did was i was so many people like you were telling me i love the appendix as much as i as the novel so i, I what i did was i collected all the appendices from the whole series into one book called when giants were upon the earth and that's where it sort of does more of the bible study aspect of it right but i still think that if you read a story you can get the bible study in, in a fresh way that makes it more uh more alive you know in some ways i would agree uh, absolutely and um this, this is just such a fascinating topic and i well for one thing, I mean, it opens this this concept of the divine council, and I know Michael Heiser talks about this too. It opens up this idea of the supernatural realm, which an awful lot of Christians are uncomfortable with at best and really ignorant of otherwise. Now, you're talking to a Pentecostal group. This audience right here is Pentecostal. Yeah. And so I think we probably have a greater appreciation of the supernatural than most Christians would. Yes. But even there, we often don't really understand the mechanics of what's going on behind the miraculous. And I, I think it helps a lot to kind of get a grasp of some of that at least. So that, that's yeah. what fascinates me. No, absolutely. Now, um, that's why you remember Frank Peretti, you know, I don't know, 20 years ago, whatever. He was, you know, he was the first one to write the spiritual warfare books, right? And um, while I'm not in the modern day spiritual warfare movement, uh, I still appreciated those books and such, but but there's an aspect of that 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 my approach, my understanding, is is not quite like that. In other words, his focus was more on the, like there's you know the demons of lust or 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 you know whatever, attributing a lot of things to demons, and that's sort of like to me that's like looking at the um, uh, looking at the low level, but the 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 this divine counsel thing is more like looking at the generals. What are the generals in the spiritual war doing and what are they about? And they're the ones who are leading the process here, uh, which is not to deny the demons, but it's certainly to understand that there's a bigger picture going on. And this goes back to what I was saying, where the ancient mind and particularly the ancient Jews understood these, these powerful principles. That's where Paul gets the concept, principalities and powers. He's actually talking about those very things. Don't worry, don't worry, you guys. We're not fighting it. This low level of war that we have here in terms of, you know, they're persecuting us and killing us. That's not who we're fighting against. We're actually fighting against principalities of powers. Why? Because we brought the gospel that, that um, disinherits those pagans 
from those deities and frees them to come into the kingdom of God. And that, of course, makes Satan, you know, just lose his, lose his mind. Right. And that, that, that's why they were, that's why they were persecuting them, you know? Um, and so th that's where Satan, I guess, Satan does come into this in, 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 in a, in a very real way. And what I do in my series is, so here's the interesting thing though, as I study, I also find that I'm not so sure there's a lot of the things that we, we under, we have the typical understanding of Satan in, in today's Christendom in various branches. I, I, I don't, I don't know if all of it's all that biblical. I mean, some of it's drawn from some biblical ideas, but some, I don't necessarily agree with all of it. Like for example, um, in the old Testament, they're, they're really, the, the name Satan is actually a, it's a word actually in the new Testament as well. And you know, this Don, right? The, the word Satan is not a name. It's actually an office. It's an, it's called adversary. It's called the adversary. The name is actually Hasatan, which means the adversary. And the problem is, is that they transliterated the Hebrew or the Greek, uh, so to speak, it, rather than translating it. And, and that's why we come up with the name as if it's one single being. And, um, I'm, in the in the New Testament, I will agree that Jesus seems to seems to address that individual being. But in the Old Testament, you you don't really get that picture. You know, in fact, there's one there's one passage where God is called Satan, and the reason why this is you know atheists like to point this out. Ah, see, your Bible contradicts itself. You know. But the reason why is the, the word Hasatan means the adversary, the violent adversary. And what happens is it's talking about that moment when uh, God's about to punish David for, you know, for disobeying him, for taking the census, right? And so he's, he's the adversary against David because David disobeyed him, right? That's all it means, right? And so, um, and there is a, a, a Satan being in Job, and there is one in... Um, the high priest Joshua, I can't remember which prophet that is. But what I'm saying uh, Zechariah. is, Zechariah. So what I'm saying is the way that being operates in the Old Testament is kind of different from the New Testament. And I haven't worked out my understanding of why that is. But in the Old Testament, he's depicted more as a, he's, he's a, um, almost an officer, he's doing God's work. Like, in other words, God in, in the heavenly throne room, in the heavenly court, when God is judging Israel for disobeying him. The Satan comes up and he accuses. It's like the prosecutor, right? He's accusing, and he's part of that process that God uses in order to bring his his prophets are his lawyers that bring a lawsuit against Israel. So it's this legal thing that's going on, and Satan is depicted more as part of that intended process. And I'm not saying that he isn't evil or anything like that. Don't get me wrong, but it doesn't have that same notion in it that we often think of him as like he was the guardian angel and fell and, and all this. Um, the, the passages that they get that from in Isaiah and Ezekiel, I'm not so sure I, I understand them that same way as I used to. But anyway, well, I, I hope I'm not going down a rabbit hole or off topic. Yeah. Well, it may be that the Old Testament, what we're calling Satan, is actually talking about more than one being. Yeah, there may be different spiritual beings each time, and that's yeah. possible. And, then, and um, certainly adversarial, certainly, yeah. you know, I mean, okay. wicked, uh, you know, uh, at times, like with Job, yeah. right? Yeah. What? Yeah. This is, um, I, I think, Tim, you want to open us up for questions? And because I imagine everybody has a few. This is such a fascinating topic. Yeah, I would like to ask a question, Brian. Uh, I read all your Nephilim books, and could you talk about like, like what I was impressed with, uh, like Father Abraham, you know, I, I looked at Father Abraham as an old guy, you know, uh, you know, that, that uh, Jesus or God found and cut a covenant. But when you talked about him, I mean, he was a mighty general that, that even Pharaoh was intimidated about. I mean, and, you know, can you talk about Abraham a little bit about how you see Abraham. Yes, absolutely. I'm trying to find that passage. Um, so, the, yeah, Abraham was another one of the characters like Noah that, well, of course, he did, you know, 
how old did he grow to become before he even had his son? So he was an old, he did become an old man, but we tend to see him like perpetually as that old man what, that, with white hair and oh, sweet father Abraham. But there's this one passage in Genesis that made me change my mind because I realized in order for this to happen, okay, and where is that? Don, can you help me? The one where he goes and he, he, he brings back so it's it's sometime it's uh is it related to Lot? Ah that would be around like chapter thirteen, maybe somewhere in there in that neighborhood. I'm surprised I don't have it highlighted here. Um <laughs> I should have it. I'll find it. Oh right. I think it's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He rescues Lot. Yeah, yeah. So he rescues Lot, right? Yeah, that was it. So I think it's um fourteen. Genesis fourteen. So by the way, Genesis 14, 8, this is a side thing, but I'll, I'll get there. <laughs> it says the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah and Adma, etc., went out and joined battle in the valley of Siddim with Keterlaomer, king of Elam. And then uh, it talks about the, 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 the bitumen pits. And then it says that they took Lot, the son of Abraham's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom. And then someone in thir thir 13, it says... Uh, the, Someone escaped and told Abraham the Hebrew that, you know, they have your, your nephew, right? So then it says in verse 14, When Abraham heard that his kinsman Lot had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and, and his kinsmen Lot with his possessions. So, this, so of course, this was uh, before Sodom was destroyed, right? But that's where I realized, oh my gosh, he had a household of trained men, and he led them on a, on a, res on a what would they call that, like a Navy SEAL extraction mission, you know what I mean? Because all these five kings had actually captured Lot. So I don't know how big their armies were, but we're talking approximately five kings there. And so if Abraham can take 318 of his men and be able to take back his, his Lot, those guys are pretty, pretty powerful warriors, right? That's how I realized, you know, Abraham is definitely everything we said he was, but maybe he was more than we realized. And maybe he too was a warrior man. And so uh, I tried to depict him that way in, in the Abraham Allegiant novel, like you're mentioning. And that's one of those ways where it's like, okay, I'm doing things different. I'm going against the grain of what a lot of our preconceived ideas are that we've been raised to think, but I'm not going against the Bible. I'm actually trying to let the Bible sort of find the things in the Bible we've missed and open our eyes to see it in a fresh way. And that's, that was a good example of that, Tim. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question or? Yes, uh, that was good. Anybody else have any questions? I've never seen Brian stumped. I've seen him on panels a number of times and I've never seen him oh, fold now, a question. I, 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 have, your... I have many times said, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, I would, I would appreciate your insight on. There's a um, there's a book by this fellow named Saul Walensky. It's called Rules for Radicals. He actually dedicates the front of it to um, Satan, and he calls him the original radical. And what was um, disturbing to me was um, hearing um, Clinton and Obama tout that as a wonderful guideline on how to essentially run a country, but to take down a country. That just, um, yeah, me the, the creeps. I've read that book, actually, and um, it is important to understand because that is the, the, the strategy that a lot of the left is using. Now, here's how I understand a lot of that. First of all, I don't, I honestly don't believe these people believe in, in God or Satan. But what they do is they, that doesn't mean they're not being used by Satan though. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but what I'm saying is I don't think that they're secretly Luciferian or anything like that. I, I know there's a lot of people who have that stuff going around saying stuff like that. I don't, I think what it is, is they're atheists, they hate God, and they know that culture is 
uh, still j basically Judeo-Christian, at least in our origins, right? And so, you know, the image of Satan as the ultimate bad guy is very common in our culture. And because they are against our culture, they'll use that, they'll use the image of wickedness or evil that we use, and they'll flip it. That they're that against Judeo Christianity, and they'll mm. so they'll say so. Satan's a hero because really, if you think about it from a different perspective, he is he is the unique individual who would not let anyone have authority over him. You know that kind of a thing, which is what we believe, right? That's what the left thinks. So I think that they they use it symbolically and mythologically because that's how they see it. Mm. However, from our Christian perspective, that doesn't mean that they're not controlled by Satan. You know what I'm saying? Like. The fact that they that they do embrace even the mythology as they understand it of Satan mm. makes them, in my opinion, very much manipulated by that by that world. If that makes sense. Yeah. So so I'm not in the camp that would say like there's a secret Luciferians and all this. I I don't know anything about that, and I I don't I don't tend to 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 follow that stuff. But that's how because I've understood that there's you know especially in the scholarly realm as well the um you know uh uh. And, you know, like the feminist world has done this as well, where it's sort of like, you know, they've made, um, so like Jezebel, they, in, in recent decades, some in the, in the third wave feminism have embraced Jezebel. Why? Because she's an ultimate villain in the Bible. So then they've even named a website after Jezebel that's real popular and famous, right? And it's sort of like, oh, she's the bad girl, but we know that she's just a bad girl who who uh, who was um, oppressed by the patriarchy and the oppressive male patriarchy. See what I'm saying? It's like through their eyes, they're just doing, they're just reinterpreting it the opposite because they are against us. So they're saying, well, I don't think she was bad. She was probably just oppressed by men and you can't blame her for, for doing what she needed to do to survive, that kind of stuff, right? And, and that's another aspect of where, which is, you know, how I understand things like that today. Like in my book, Jezebel, I definitely, I, I, first of all, I also don't believe in doing cardboard villains. Mm. I believe that evil people do, do believe, or let's put it this way. They do seek to justify what they're doing is good. So even though they're evil, in their own mind, they're good. So when I wrote my story of Jezebel, I didn't write her as a evil, conniving, snidely whiplash, right? What I depicted her as was very sophisticated because Tyre was a very uh, cosmopolitan, like New York, right? And I said, well, if she would be like a, a city person who's really sophisticated and Tyre actually was sophisticated they they uh traded with all over the world so they had a lot of knowledge of a lot of cultures right and then she just saw israel as this poor backwoods backwards you know primitive nation you know it's like oh they're so sad they only worship one god they don't have any sophistication and they weren't as rich as tyre right so she justified it in her own mind so she thought she was helping them by bringing Baal, right mm -hmm. however so, so when you re first read my Jezebel novel, you'll actually see her actually falling in love with Ahab and they actually have a good marriage at first. Now, it, there is a degradation over time because her evil does become manifest and it does twist. And, and by the end, she's doing a lot more things deliberately than the beginning. But that's how we are as, as being, being human beings. We all change or we all sort of we try to look one way and then our real selves come out, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's another example where the Jezebel story, I try to capture that, that, that reality. And so she's also very much modernized, kind of almost feminist, right? Mm -hmm. And she says a lot of things that you'll recognize, phrases that will connect that. But also, they, they believe in child sacrifice. And child sacrifice, you know, we look at that today and we go, uh, well, of course, maybe you guys don't because, you know, you're you're very learned Christians. We all know it's abortion is human sacrifice. Right. But but, you know, step back a little bit from our learning and realize that most people will look at that and just go, you know, who would how could they believe in child sacrifice? It's just so absurd, you know, um, but if they really believed in the gods. But here's the thing. They really believed that in the gods. And so 
when when the city or the nation uh, was under siege in, with war or uh, droughts or famines or whatever, they believed that to appease the gods, they would sacrifice the children of the nobility of the city, actually, is usually what it was. And that was sort of like their, their um, what's the word, uh, like the 1%, you know, they, they have to be the ones who sort of stand up for the poor people too. So they sacrifice their children and that appeases the gods and, and, and will hopefully get rid of the famine, et cetera. And so in other words, they're sacrificing their children to have a better life, to have a more convenient life, to get rid of pain and suffering, right? And so these are all the justifications that modern day people use to justify abortion as well. And so I sort of paint the whole child sacrifice system in a way that I try to make people understand how it could be possible. It, it really can be. If you put yourself in their mindset and you understand this, and then as you're reading it, you're starting to see the language that they use is the same language as abortion, you know? Uh, sure, the modern day world doesn't believe in bail, right? They're not sacrificing to bail. Well, they don't have to deliberately be sacrificing to the name Baal to be sacrificing to Baal because Baal was the storm god of power. And so, and this is all about power, right? The whole thing is about power. Women should have power and they should be able to kill their babies so they can have power. That's what they want, power, power, power. And, and, um, and so, so I bring all that into the ancient story in a way that helps you see how it's relevant to today and makes sense of today as well. At the same time, it also makes sense of these extreme ancient Bronze Age, you know, cultural things, you know. <laughs> Some of the stuff they do is weird, right? But, but if you can try to get in their mindset, at least you can understand. It doesn't make it wrong, right or wrong, but if you can get into their mindset, you can understand how and why they're thinking that way. Then you can also see, oh, then that's kind of how we are today too, you know, that kind of a thing. That's my that's my intent, at least. Interesting. Very well said, Brian. Can I Anybody ask you else? A, a question about uh, you know these gods that uh, I know Rome had their gods, Egypt had their gods, Greek the Greeks had theirs. Then you had the Canaanites uh, gods, which we hear about and read about in the Bible, and I think all of us on this call and probably are watching uh, later. Or uh, you know, you know, we we uh, pride ourselves in being learned biblical scholars, and so you know, so we you know we know about the Jews' plot in in the uh, land of Canaan, but uh, are these the same people with different or not people, but are these the same entities with different names? I mean that that, that fascinates me when you you. You know, you went down like the god of uh, goddesses uh, <clears throat> of sex and war. Uh, you know, they all had the same the same sort of entity, but different names. Yeah, yeah. That's and if you look historically, there are linkages to all of them. Like, for instance, Ishtar in Babylonia was the Mesopotamian goddess, who's very much like Ashtart of Phoenicia who's very much like, um, oh, I can't think of another, uh, uh, she just has different names, right? Um, Baal has different, different connections as well to Zeus. He has connections to the storm god in Mesopotamia as well, Hadad. So uh, historically, yes, there's a, there's a lot of interconnection between some of these, maybe, maybe, you know, this is where it goes a little bit too deep for me that then, then I actually know some, some Christians like Derek Gilbert go more in depth into connecting how these gods are all connected and maybe even how they, you know, came from Mesopotamia and influenced and all that. Um, so in principle, they are influenced by each other. And, and so therefore some of them are just different names for the same being, absolutely. Some of them are just like, you might have the Greek pantheon and you have an Egyptian pantheon and they're very different and they existed independently. However, there's a lot of similarities between all pantheons, like Don was saying, there's always a, there's always a king at the top, right? And, and they all have a council. And so there is commonalities to which I would just attribute that to the fact that that's, like we talked about, that's, 
that's the spiritual reality, but pagans who are fallen from God, their mind is darkened but from the truth, and so they, they come up with a twisted version of that reality, right? Now, whether or not they are this literally the same spiritual beings, I cannot speak to. That's the area of complete speculation. In my novels, my principle is this. My principle is that uh, it, it's not that there are, it's like there are a bunch of fallen watchers, a bunch of, you know, and, and I don't know how many of them are over each nation. Maybe there's only one, maybe there's several. It doesn't really explain it in detail. Um, so, and, and, um, and because all these nations, a lot of them exist at the same time, so they obviously couldn't be the same beings. So what I see it as is the spiritual beings sort of take on the identities as, as convenience, like in other words, when they need to. So I don't necessarily think there's only one being that's Baal, who is a, an actual spiritual being named Baal, uh, who would also be Zeus, or who might not be, you know. What I think is that there's a spiritual realm, demonic realm behind it. Man makes up all these different deities, and, and, and man was making a lot of them up. Uh, and then they just sort of use their identities as they, as they need, if that makes sense. That's how I've conceived it. But at the end of the day, what I'm arguing here is it's speculation because nobody really knows. So I think that the, 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 the safest biblical thing that I try to say is uh, there's a demonic reality behind them. But what that specifically looks like, I don't know. So I just take the, so in my novels, I just take the, I have some of them evolving, or shall we say, some of them I have uh, being a god in one country, and then he ends up going to another country, and becomes another god. But some of them I have separate gods, and some of them one, one angel plays different gods because, you know, he, he can, right? <laughs> you know, uh, so if that makes sense, you know, um, I think what I'm saying is that I don't think anybody really knows, so you have to speculate. And I can do it for my novels because I have to, but in real life, I wouldn't, I wouldn't seek to, to commit to any specific way because I just don't know. Mm -hmm. My long-winded uh, uh, explanations of things. No, that was good. Do we have any more uh, questions? If you do, unmute yourself and you can ask. I could, I could go all night with a lot of questions. For one thing, you talk about, you don't know if there's really anybody who knows about it, but you're looking at a man who does because I deal demonics every day of my life. I've been working with demonics for over 15 years. I've seen demons come out of people. I've seen demons in my own presence many times. And, and you know, the guys, they've heard a lot of my stories and everything, but I've lived in villages in Haiti. I've lived in uh, villages in uh, Central America. I deal with them to minds. You know, it's easy for me to recognize them because I used to be one. I mean, everybody that's heard my testimony, I was a very demonic person for 50 years of my life. Very demonic. I belong to pagan churches. I've been to different places. I've worked with uh, spiritual things. And one thing about you were talking about the spirits. Everybody is a sign of demonic spirit. Satan has got everybody covered. And I've recognized that through the years that some of the same spirits just take over different bodies. There's a lot of things here. I mean, I, I don't know if you've ever experienced a demonic being or anything. I, you know, I know I've listened to your stories here. I experience them quite often. For one thing, I do a lot of deliverance on people with demons in them. You know, it's easy. I didn't want what I have. God gave it to me. I've had different experts call me and tell me, God chose you to do this. And we're going in a time of the world right now where it's going to be very prevalent in everybody's life. We're going into a different situation. We're getting closer to the end times, and it's written in the Word. I'm not a Bible scholar like you. I appreciate your knowledge. But see, I, my difference is, I don't have the same knowledge because I didn't walk into a church believing in God till I was 52 years old. And I'm 68 now. So I have very little knowledge except what God uses. 
you know, it gives me, I pray for wisdom, I pray for knowledge, and I pray for strength to continue doing this. I love what I do. I love working with demonic people. I'd seen spirits come out of little children that hadn't spoken 12 years because they had a demon inside of themselves. But that demon was oppressing that child and he couldn't even speak. And all I did was lay hands on him and the demon came out and the child spoke for the first time in 12 years. This is what I'm seeing. Yeah. I, I think this would be a good point to, to, to make a distinction at least that I do believe there is a biblical uh, distinction here, though, between uh -huh. demons and watchers or principalities. And that I could say because demons are definitely the evil spirits in search of hosts, et, et cetera, in search of bodies. Um, now, interestingly, the Bible does not say anything about who they are, or where they come from, just that they're there. However, the Book of Enoch and some other sources that I do trust do make the argument that demons are not the same thing as sons of God. They are evil spirits in control. You know, sons of God exactly. can control them, watch exactly. us control them. But, yes. but um, so I see them as more like the troops and, you know, the watchers are, are the, the generals. But uh, so, so that whole demonic reality that you're describing is like, yeah, that's, I, I have no problem with that. And, but, I, but what's interesting is that the, uh, Enoch suggests that the demons are actually the spirits of the dead Nephilim and the Nephilim who were killed in the flood. And so those are the, that's the evilness where they come from. They're all connected in that sense. And I do so, study Enoch. I have books here on Enoch. I yeah. Do yeah. Enoch. So anyway, important. that's, that's why, you know, and that's why Messiah, Jesus has power over the Nephilim, he's clear, he clears out the Nephilim because that's what God wants, you know, like when, when Jesus came into the land of Israel, he's casting out these demons. And what are they? They're Nep the spirits of the Nephilim, which originally Joshua and David were told to get rid of, and they got rid of almost all of them, but not quite. And then when Jesus comes, he's casting them out of the land because Messiah has come, right? So that's why we have in the power of Messiah, we have that power over the demons. That's why. That's, that's right. how I understand it, at least. But, you know, it's, but, kind of, it's kind of good that you and I only live three hours apart, so maybe we need to get together and sit down on these things. <laughs> I, can take you on, I can take you on some journeys if oh, you wish. <laughs> oh, you're in Houston. I'm in Houston. You're I'm the not one far in Houston. You. Okay, I got you. So uh, you and I could take some journeys. I can take you in some demonic places, believe me. <laughs> hey, I saw I saw Dean Landis. Are you on, Dean? You had your hand raised? I don't know if he's muted. I see Lawrence Andrews. He writes about the Kabbalah and Kemetic hey. Tree of Life. There's an example, Don. I don't know. <laughs> Lawrence, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. How you doing? Hey. Hi. Hey, brother. Hi, How Lawrence. you doing? I'm not prepared to be on video right now, but you can hear my voice. How you guys doing? God bless you. <laughs> yeah, right? so, yeah, um, I was talking about the Kabbalah and the Kemet and Tree of Life, and basically, uh, because people could say, I, I heard him talking about the different, you know, the Nephilim. And then uh, when you asked him about uh, spirits and how they uh, are named by different peoples, but kind of like they sound like the same spirit. Um, <laughs> I've studied this so extensively before I became a uh, full blown uh, gospel based Christian. Um, I actually like was into uh, the Kometan Tree of Life. I mean, I studied a lot of different things. But again, what brought me to Jesus was the fact that he was the only one that uh, he didn't break his connection to God and he unified us with who God was through his sacrifice. Amen. So, but in the book of Ephesians, it definitely talks about lightly uh, when it talks about powers and principalities against rulers of the darkness of this age, like God, he never denied that there's other powers and, and things of nature out there that we can't see, but understanding that Jesus has all the authority. Yes. So we have, we walk in that authority through the shared experience of the Holy Spirit inside of us as being a part of the Godhead, the Elohim. You know what I mean? I mm -hmm. get that and I understand that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. You got to kind of, I'm a Q&A kind of guy. You got to ask me a question. I can give you some information, but I've studied a lot. So, um, and I lived it and I'm, and I can agree with uh, brother Larry, um, 
I've dealt with deliverance a lot too. You know, I'm an evangelist and I definitely spread the gospel and I can bring and and what I've been able to do is God given me, has given me the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, I want to say unique experience of being able to explain the gospel to the guy on the street. That's a homeless guy. And also to the person that has traveled in Greek philosophy, uh, in esoterics and all that other stuff and explain why Christ is so important and about the Christ consciousness and everything like that. You know what I mean? And I heard you talking about councils and things, and that brought me to Melchizedek. And I know that there's something out there about the Ascension and about, uh, you know, dimensions and the, you know, we can get on different levels all the way around here, but, but the ultimate, what I stand on the ultimate fact is what my foundation is built upon is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Cause that's where it all begins, right? The Amen. reconciliation of man back to who God is Amen. and himself, you know? Amen. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, I don't know anything about the comedic tree or Kabbalah, so I wouldn't know what to ask you. So I'm I, sorry about that, Lawrence, but I'm no, sure no, you could, fine. you could talk at length sometime about that as well. Yeah. I just, I would say just, you know, with things like that, it, it has such a form of godliness and, and to a degree, like if you're not on that, if you don't know where you stand as far as, you know, in our faith, it's easy to get pulled out to really far to where you're looking around and you don't remember where you're at. You know what I mean? So yeah. you got to be careful and know where your foundation is before you go into things like that. You know, yeah. it's dangerous. Yeah. You know? Amen. Well, this has been a great meeting and uh, we, I, th I think we have stimulated a lot of curiosity and, and I would, <laughs> I would encourage oh, turn it off, I to get some of Brian's books. I mean, they're fascinating. Uh, you know, you can sit down and you, it's hard to stop once you, once you get rolling, Don, like you said, I mean, you get, you get to know these characters and the, and the same angels and the same, you know, fallen ones, you know, they come down through the lines. I mean, they're, they're, uh, you know, the same ones yeah, that, yeah, there. Brian has a lot of other books too. If you're interested in film, Brian does some great analysis of, of morality in film and and where Hollywood's at today. Like the book Word Pictures, I would highly recommend. Uh, so I mean, there's no, a lot it, of variety in what that he's doesn't done. E that doesn't exist anymore. I changed the name of the book, so you can't wow. get it. It's now called The Imagination of God. Okay. And but the other well book worth is, Oh, thank you. I was gonna say the other book is Hollywood Worldviews. And if you guys like watching, if you like movies uh, or television and like me, I love them, but I acknowledge there's a lot of garbage out there, unfortunately, but there still is some good stuff. And um, I, I, one of my ministries is to help Christians to be able to see, discern the good from the bad so that you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater just because you see something you don't like and throw it out. You know, we can't, we don't always agree with everything, but there's a lot of good stuff out there, although it's getting less and less, I will admit in Hollywood, particularly, <laughs> but um, if, if you do love things like, you know, Mandalorian, Star Wars and all stuff like that, I try to help people to understand story so that you can interpret what's happening as you're watching it. it, it it's, 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 it's like movie appreciation 101 type of thing. I think, um, I, real quick, I'd interject. Um, I saw Lord of the Rings, and I, now when I watch movies, I just see the story over and over and over again and everything. But, I mean, even the Lord of the Rings and, and the, the whole uh, drama behind it, is, it's so biblically based, it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. so you're saying that you write books to, to bring awareness to that kind of thing? Yep, yep, to help awesome. uh, help people understand how to how to understand the nature of stories so that when you're watching it you'll be more aware and more appreciative actually okay amen i met brian in the context of hollywood where he was writing and producing and directing and he's done a lot more work than we've even talked about here today but i know very few people with a grasp of story like he has and is that understanding of how it applies to film so any of that so if you're really interested in movies look into those things as well Thanks. Brian, how can people get in touch with you and uh, see your work? And Well, Godawa.com. That's my name, G-O-D-A-W-A.com. Everything's there. And there's a lot of free stuff, too. I made a very interesting website. If you just want to look more into this stuff, what is he really talking about? I've got, like, 
I've got descriptions of the stories and I've got pictures of the, of the actor, of the characters in the stories. And, and I also have a lot of references that if you're interested in going deeper or whatever, uh, but also, you know, everything, everything of mine is exclusively on Amazon. All my materials, all my books are in paperback, ebook or audiobook. So, and they're all on Amazon. So, um, and, and at a, at a, a low price, I might add. So, well, we, we want to thank you for uh, being our guest speaker. And, uh, you know, I know I think it was very fascinating. I'm sure everybody else does too. And uh, so anyhow, we want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Merry and, Christmas indeed. Yes. And uh, I'm glad, I hope you're settled in. I know you, you, move, you were moving when I was talking to you from uh, Hollywood to uh, Dallas. So uh, I'm sure that's a different world you know, over there. And so you, we wish you the best and, and hope you. you hope you can bring some of these books to, to Hollywood. So, uh, you know, you can get the word out and cause they do have a Christian tone to them and lift up the, the name of God and, uh, the most high God and Don and Volson, uh, thank you very much for showing up and you get, did a great job. It was nice to sit back and, and watch, watch the conversation of, uh, Theologians. Oh, thanks. I, I just love being able to connect with Brian again. We haven't really sat face to face in quite Been a while. Been too long. So. Too long. One of my best friends in Hollywood ever. So, Amen. So this Amen. was fun. Amen. Thank well, you. God guys. bless everybody. God bless you. God